All right, thanks for joining us today. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining the Alaska Hot Topics in Sexual Health Education, a live presentation of Lessons Learned from the December 2017 National Sex Education Conference in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Today, you'll hear from two sexual health educators in Alaska, Jordan Kamer from the Reproductive Health Clinic in Anchorage, Alaska, and Anna Meredith from Catchmack Bay Family Planning Clinic in Homer. Just a couple of housekeeping tips. Um, those of you listening here live, you can comment on the content as we go along, especially since presenters will have questions for you as we go. Also, if you have specific questions for the presenters, we will be answering those at the close of the presentations. Please qualify those as a question in the comment box for specific presenters so we know who to address it to at the end. An archived recording of this YouTube live event will be available this afternoon for you to share or review again for posterity. I'm your host, Jenny Baker, with the Youth Alliance for Healthy Alaska, and I will now turn it over to our first presenter, Jordan Kamer. Hi, so my name is Jordan Kamer, and I am a public health educator for the Reproductive Health Clinic in Anchorage, Alaska, working for the municipality of Anchorage. So uh, just a most of the what I took away from the conference was a lot of LGBTIQ uh, rights and awarenesses and how to be inclusive. So most of my presentation is based on inclusion, anti-oppression, sex positivity for LGBTIQ youth in all audience, just trying to be as inclusive as possible. So um, this was from the National Sex Ed Conference, December 6th through 9th. So I thought this was kind of a good quote on how to be inclusive for all by Harvey Milk. So he was a civil rights advocate for minorities as well as LGBTIQ um, back in 1977 as the first openly elected gay official uh, in the US and this was in San Francisco. So a lot of terms uh, are new to a lot of people for LGBTIQ um, definitions and this is just kind of a small smattering of words and exactly what they mean. I have a link, few links at the end of my slides on where you could um, read more of these in more detail from me. Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide and kind of move right on to the genderbred person. I think it's a really good infographic for people to be aware of the terms and what they mean. So gender identity is how someone feels they are on the inside. Do they identify as a woman? or a male, uh, you could identify as say two spirits. Uh, a lot of indigenous people do, they don't identify as either male or female. Someone could identify as gender queer, maybe they don't feel they fit into either female or male um, identity. Gender expression is what someone shows on the outside. Who are you presenting to other people? Is it a feminine uh, presentation or is it a masculine one? Um, some terms that could come to mind are femme androgynous, so someone who kind of dresses neither feminine nor male. Uh, gender neutral, that's someone who feels that uh, rather than not identifying as either, they feel that they could be both, but they're just going to keep it neutral. Biological sex is the hormones, gonads, um, sex characteristics, we would say, of being male or female. So biological sex is what the doctor, when a baby is born, the doctor says, oh, it's a boy, oh, it's a girl. So someone could also be intersex. There are, are I think, 1% of the population in America is actually born as having sex characteristics that are not completely identified as 100% male, 100% female. Sexual attraction is a little different than all of those because it's who you like, who you're sexually attracted to. You could be attracted to males or females. Um, you could also be romantically attracted. That's different than sexual attraction. So an important thing to remember is that a it is more appropriate to say sexual orientation as to who you like. So that's your attraction rather than preference. Preference makes it feel like someone would have a, a choice. And a lot of times these things aren't a choice. It's how someone feels they are on the inside, which is deeply rooted rather than it's not a preference, like the way I prefer the color purple over blue. So, um, so how do we as society think that we are inclusive to LGBTQI youth? And uh, this slide, there's just a couple of infographics. You don't have to read all of them. But basically, youth who are don't identify as um, heteronormative or cisgender, they face a lot of discrimination in schools. So they're about three times more likely to be sanctioned in schools. 
three times more likely to be involved in juvie or criminal justice system as a result of school discipline. Uh, they feel that, uh, that, and this research I think was from Gleason, so the Gay, Lesbian, Straight uh, Education Network. So 28% of youth who are LGBTQIQ report unequal discipline for public displays of affection. So a little bit more of discrimination for things that other teens, uh, it's considered normal. So uh, basically a lot of takeaway from the conference was how to be more inclusive for these youth in schools and in healthcare because it does cross over into both sides. So affirming practices would be making pronouns more visible. So that's me, that would be, have been me starting off my presentation saying, my personal pronouns are she, her, and hers. Someone could be he, his, um, and him. Someone could also identify as they, maybe they don't want to be identified as specifically male or female. So they is a common one, so they, there's them. So using more inclusive language, so neutral things like bodies instead of her body or his body. So paperwork, uh, when people sign in, so maybe their name is Lawrence, but maybe they are uh, preferring to be called Sarah or Sally and they're transitioning. So that would help on an intake form. Uh, more options for gender orientation and sex on intake forms. So showing support like stickers, posters, all sorts of fun things saying that this is a positive, safe, friendly place. One big thing with a lot of the LGBTQI community is don't assume anything. If you aren't sure, ask. Um, it never hurts to ask. I am not sure what to call you. Can you lead me in the right direction? Or what do you want to be called? Or how do I say that? Um, it's always better to ask than to assume so you don't accidentally offend someone. Factual medical information is really important for youth. Um, youth who are LGBTQ are much more likely to look up things on Google for health information rather than asking a medical provider or family member. So making sure that factual medical information is um, uh, of ready and available. So letting youth, it, this applies to all youth, not just uh, someone who doesn't identify as heteronormative, but letting them be free to who they are. So less what are you assessments and more who are you. One thing that we saw in some of the presentations is a lot of youth as well as adults felt that providers and or staff was too busy trying to figure out what someone was rather than maybe they're there for knee pain. That has nothing to do with your orientation or your uh, genital status. So um, just see them for the knee pain rather than trying to assess everything else. So protections from harassment is a big one that should be available to all people. It doesn't matter who you are. So supportive and trained educators. So being as open and inclusive as possible to everyone. So student-led clubs are a big one. Uh, it helps people to feel included if you have someone who is like-minded or is at least supportive of you. So having a more inclusive curriculum, so going back to those pronouns, neutral language, bodies instead of he, hers, things like that. More research, resources, training, policy, advocacy. If there isn't a lot of research, we can't find the best direction to go in. So less intrusive personal questions. Um, apparently a big no-no is if someone is doing a gender transition, asking them, oh, did you do the whole transition? It's, it's rude. It would be like asking someone, oh, did you have a, a breast implant job or something? So if you can look at it in that perspective, you can see how um, impolite it would be to ask really personal questions like that. So positive impacts of being more inclusive is um, it decreases negative experiences, youth feel included, increases staff intervention, in cohesiveness, and what you get out of it is better health, health education, and school total education. So um, I thought these were really cool. So this is something called a cue card. So LGBTQ uh, youth could write down exactly with their personal pronouns, what they prefer to be called, um, their names, uh, as well as maybe a health history. And instead of a provider having to sit down and spend 20 minutes trying to sort through the same things every time, when a patient checks in is for a youth to just hand this card over to the provider say these are my personal pronouns this is my health uh, health concerns today so the one on the bottom the pronouns how to guide is just kind of a fun way to um, determine what words you would use in what situation so this one is a more comprehensive list of personal pronouns people would prefer to be called so he she they uh there's v Z, Z, I probably will stumble over pronouncing these, but you do see that there's a really big variety. So if you're not sure, just make sure you ask someone on what you prefer to be called, because there's a, a big list. So oppression and privilege. 
this came into, this was kind of interwoven throughout a lot of the uh, presentation, the sessions that we went to at the conference. So health inequities, basically all these words basically boil down to is health inequities are systemic oppression across age, gender, race, social class, and sexual orientation that people experience rooted in a lot of isms. So ageism, patriarchy, racism, classism. Some stats on people who are oppressed have lower health outcomes and equities in terms of like Alaska natives have a 2.1 more times um, likely to have a stroke. LGBT youth and adults are lo more likely to delay or not seek medical care, maybe because they're embarrassed or it's awkward, or maybe they don't feel included at their healthcare practice. Also, um, it refers to any oppressed group. So six in 10 women in Alaska suffer, suffer from sexual or intimate partner violence. So groups with higher percentages of fair poor health who report either more physically unhealthy days and more mentally unhealthy days are women, older persons, younger persons, minority racial ethnic groups, less education, those who speak another language besides English at home, and those with a disability. Disability could be physical, it could be mental, it could be um, like a visual disability, like someone who doesn't see as well or is blind. So these are all the isms that exist in our society. So there's racism, sexism, cis-sexism, which means everyone is either basically straight um so gender conforming that you if you were born with female body parts then that would say that you identify as female so uh cissexism is a is uh, against someone who happens to be maybe transgender or agender or intersex heterosexism is basically uh being preferential only to people who are hetero or like the opposite sex rather than someone who's a lesbian or gay uh, class, classism, the wealth, wealthy versus the poor, poverty, ableism, whether someone is able to physically move about as they wish or if they are limited by certain things, religious oppression, um, as well as ageism or adultism. So there's oppression on both sides uh, against youth who maybe can't access things versus someone who is elderly and doesn't isn't able to access things. So privilege is important because becoming aware of your privilege shouldn't be viewed as a burden or a source of guilt, but rather an opportunity to learn and be responsible so that we, we can work towards a more just and inclusive world. So some um, privilege that is very ingrained in our society is white, male, class, specifically middle or upper class, Christian religions, Cisgender, so someone who identifies as either male or female, able-bodied and heterosexual, so someone who identifies as straight. So privilege is basically unearned access to social power based on membership in a dominant social group. So to step back from all of that, think of something as being right-handed or left-handed. Our entire society is based on most things being right-handed. So think coffee mugs, um, driving in the Western hemisphere in a car, all of the, a lot of the dials are in the middle of the car. Uh, right-handedness is considered normal. Um, people who are left-handed historically have been perceived as deviant, dangerous, sinister. Um, it turns into internalized oppression where you think maybe I'm not as normal as everyone else. Passing and code shifting, so people trying to change their behavior to fit into this world. Um, and people who are right-handed were unconscious of the privilege that we have as being right-handed, so the privilege of ignorance. And this turns into institutionalized and systemic nature of privilege. So if you can think of it that way, you can think how easily it is to have privilege in many other ways. So that could be someone, uh, so poverty, um, skin color is a big one based on if you're light or pale or dark. Um, also we have say male tends to be, have more dominance of power than female, able-bodied, heterosexual. Credentialed education is a huge one. Um, so that would be privilege biased against the underprivileged. So I don't expect anyone to be able to read all of these, but if you can read at least one, they're just snippets. So for instance, I have never been mocked for my accent, word choice, or slang. I can see and hear reasonably well enough to navigate and enjoy my surroundings. Um, I've never had to change my behavior or stay quiet for fear of physical, sexual, emotional assault. Um, I've never been told my sexual orientation was just a phase or a choice. Um, Let's see, my race, gender, appearance has never been used as an indicator for my personal or financial stability for cash, checks, and cards. Uh, let's see, basically being able to be around people who look and talk and think like you. Um, uh, so there's a lot of ways that we have privilege in our society that's ingrained that we don't even 
realize until we're in a situation where we don't aren't the privileged ones. So this is kind of a cute infographic that I thought was interesting. It's basically, are you contributing to a space or an idea, or are you taking up space? Are you taking away from it? So just make sure that you're contributing, which basically means uh, having an open mind. So let's see, intersectionality is a really important concept throughout the conference is that people don't have any one um, uh, condition um, of discrimination. So someone could be white, someone could be female, someone could be lower income. Um, so those are all intersecting forms of discrimination that we don't think of. So for instance, this little infographic has a little blue stripey triangle. So there's support groups for triangles and support groups for stripes, but there isn't a support group for both. So someone's place um, experiencing oppression from multiple sides. So it's important to realize that many people are coming from intersecting forms of um, humanity that um, doesn't, they don't fit into a box in terms of discrimination or support groups. So uh, along the lines of discrimination, so we have rape culture in America and it starts at a very individual level. Rape jokes, cat calling, um, unsolicited genital pics, and that can go up to groping, revenge porn, stealthing, all the way up to rape. And it's an ingrained cultural existence. And so primary prevention is obviously consent, communication, dialogue. Um, branching away from sex ed is just anatomy, pregnancy, and STIs to cover relationships intersectionality, society, fairness, humanity. So if you create a more inclusive curriculum, you are more preventative against um, basically rape and the culture that pervades it. So this is a pyramid that's similar to the other one. So it shows bias leads to individual acts of prejudice, which leads to discrimination and then bias motivated violence and that it's worst would lead to um, genocide. Um, so it just shows things start at a very basic bias level and the cycle of oppression it's self-fulfilling and it continues forward. So stereotypes and bias can lead to societal level changes. So language matters with microaggressions. This is an interesting one you'll see in a lot of psychology or sociology courses. So you may not be intending to be purposely offensive, but things you say could be actually really rude. So saying um, it's just a phase, you don't act gay. Um, when you say things like, that exam just raped me, that could be a trigger word for somebody because maybe they actually were raped, so that trivializes it. So those illegal aliens um, saying, you're not like other Muslim people, you speak English so well, that's offensive. Or saying to someone who's overweight, oh, but your face is pretty. So microaggressions are really interesting. We don't realize when we say things that could be construed as rude that it actually is because we think it sounds like a compliment. So... So how to create a more supportive environment for individuals is um, basically having your identity and identity being affirmed by others or circumstances who are like you or supportive of you. Well, maybe they don't have to be like you, but maybe someone who's supportive and will listen and be your ally. So this leads to intelligence, happiness, health, kindness within the society. With those positive effects, the culture becomes one with more positive contributions and it just continues on. And you could apply this to any marginalized social groups. So gender, sexual behavior, um, LGBTQ society, culture, ethnicity, race, ability, language, religion, mental health. So sex positivity for all ages was a important theme throughout the conference. So it's comprised of five elements. There's sensuality, intimacy, sexual orientation and gender identity, sexual reproductive health and sexual behaviors and practices. So teaching sex positivity as a positive thing that uh, it means different things to all people, but being also aware of other people's uh, sexual behaviors or beliefs and being okay with that, as long as it's not you know, illegal, immoral, and unethical, things like that. So just um, having a more positive mind towards it rather than negative in consequences. So uh, sex ed tends to be geared towards teens, but uh, sex education is actually important throughout the life cycle. And it changes uh, through different ages. Um, and Adults have a lot more complicated issues usually um, that could be anywhere from body image after children or illness, um, sexual assault, PTSD, dating relationships and what we learn. So it's important for everyone, especially adults, to look for any underlying issues that might not be sexual, but it could be something that's affecting your uh, health or psyche. So using more positive or neutral wording. So 
man or adult or human rather than derogatory terms like slut, play, or bro, which have a lot of slang meanings. So learning more about healthy relationships and feeling free to explore your emotions and behaviors without fear or oppression from others. So this slide is basically how to be more, um, there's so much negative sexual education for teens and just trying to make it, um, so stress, uh, withholding information is actually preventing access. So um, a lot of curriculums are outdated, uh, lack of comprehensive education. So when it's focused on just anatomy and uh, pregnancy and consequences rather than, hey, it's something that sex is something most people are going to experience in their lifetime. So let's at least be positive and teach correct factual medical information. So uh, sex positive for, for youth is uh, just being as positive as possible using collaboration rather than authoritarian. Uh, youth need give and take rather than someone telling them what to do. So using positive terms, um, no shaming or teasing in any way, and using trauma-informed care, which Anna is gonna get into. So what happened to you, not what's wrong with you. So um, creating safe spaces and just giving out proper information. So more tidbits on being supportive and positive for others. So for youth and learning, it's being aware of the different learning styles that people have. So some people could be musical, some kids are more math oriented or word smart, uh, or self-aware versus some people are more visual learners. Um, coloring and doodles is a good way to, if they don't like the, maybe if the subject material at hand is uncomfortable, that way that they're still um, passively taking in information for a lecture, but maybe they're doodling or drawing something um, that helps to still absorb the information. So it's all about interactivity, social media, being supportive of marginalized groups is being aware of the historical trauma and events, movements of ch and changes that have happened over time. So that's also being aware of your privilege to understand how to help others rise up. So realize that we are all human and we have shared goals and values. We want to be loved and taken care of. This goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So empowerment is using more positive words instead of the negative ones. So if you give those positive words power, it helps to take away from the negative words. Um, validation, so, oh, you know, I'm sorry you're having a bad day, can I help you in any way? Rather than, you want to hear about my day, it was way worse than yours, you know, so you don't want to minimize other people's problems. So, golden rule is treat others as you would like to be treated. So, takeaway is basically be as open, polite, supportive, and inclusive to the people you meet. So, professionalism and politeness go a long way past any physical or emotional interactions that could be temporary and fleeting. So, um, basically, is what can you do to ensure inclusion for all? And here are a lot of resources that we gleaned from the conference as well as other things. So, the top three links are actually more terminology. So, if you want to know what that LGBTIQ word means. So, there's medical terminology as well as kind of slang terms that maybe you might run across as a provider. So, these are all really good resources to uh, for LGBTIQ as well as youth and um, determining your privilege as and fighting back against oppression. So thank you for listening. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jordan. I really appreciate it. Um, as we transition to our next presenter, um, just wanted to give you all um, just a couple T ideas behind how to strengthen your connections with young people. One would be the motivational interviewing workshop we have um, coming up in March. Um, we have one for clinicians and we also have one for supportive adults um, that work also with parents and other youth advocates. Um, I will be posting the links for registration um, in the chat box. Thank you so much. And next we'll transition over to Anna Meredith and Homer at Kachemak Bay Family Planning Clinic. All right, thank you, Jenny and Jordan. Um, I just want to say hello before I start in on my slides and screen share here. All right, that work? We're looking at my slides? Yes, we are. Excellent, okay, thank you. All right, so my name is Anna Meredith, <clears throat> excuse me, and I work at Kachemak Bay Family Planning Clinic's rec room which is the local teen drop-in center in Homer. And um, um, I encourage anybody, if you have any questions after this presentation, to please reach out and get a hold of us. We um, love to be available for colleagues and uh, throughout the state and nationally too. So I also attended the um, 
conference with Jordan in Atlantic City in early December. That was the second conference that I was able to attend nationally. The first one was a federal conference and it was good and the resources were excellent. Um, but this one put on by the Center for Sex Ed was really different in that a lot of direct service people were there. And so there's about seven to 800 people in attendance and they we were all sexual health educators, sex therapists and research, a lot of research people were present. And so really once the, um, audience started entering the casino that the conference was held in, the whole vibe kind of changed and it felt really good to feel like I was among my people. And it was uh, very relatable with just everybody coming in and very open, um, conversing freely. So that felt really great. It just felt a bit more uncensored than the federal conference. And I really appreciated that. That's the most helpful um, to pick up information for me as a sexual health educator. So I want to give you a little bit of background about what we do down here at the rec room. We have the Homer peer education team. We're in our seventh year of operation as the rec room and the peer ed team. We started out as the Alaska Promoting Health Among Teens or AK FAT program. And we taught in the communities only with AK FAT. And now and since then, I uh, solely went into the schools for a couple years and about four schools, and now we're teaching in 11 schools with peer educators with the Teen Unintended Pregnancy Prevention Grant. And um, historically, KBFPC has taught on the Southern Kenai Peninsula for over 25 years and always collaborated with our school district to make that happen. We have four peer educators on staff at all time, and we, with the peer, education, peer educators, excuse me, we've developed the Resiliency Informed Sexual Health and Wellness Lesson Package and we have four adaptations of that lesson package, um, the largest one being for a high school setting, and that is 12 lessons. And that's influenced from um, eight different evidence-based curricula. And the focus really is on body regulation techniques, healthy relationships, and it all is really in teen speak since the peer educators are co-facilitators with us. These are the topics that I'm uh, going to be addressing today. They were kind of the ones that I was I had in my mind going to the conference, and so I was hoping to get information on them. And um, I was it was successful in providing that info for me, and hopefully they're useful for you as well. So I'm going to start out with trauma informed language, also trauma informed care. It could be referred to, and we probably all remember when trauma informed care started to become kind of a buzzword. I know for me that happened about five years ago. Although in the whole field of neuroscience and medically, it's really happened since the early 90s when the ACEs um, study was conducted. And so this is kind of hitting the whole medical and educational field by storm in a really positive way, positive storm. Um, we are, um, hopefully we're all gathering information and education about ACEs and trauma. And as it's a shared human thing that we all um, have experienced or know somebody who has and so really changing our tone when we work with young people, which we do here, and people of all ages. And so I have a question for you all. So how many of you feel that you have a firm grasp on what trauma-informed care means? And I'm gonna try and see the response to that poll because I can't see it right now. Okay, I'm not able to see that response. That would be helpful, but it's okay. I've prepared for whether people are um, very informed on trauma-informed care or whether some more information that's more in-depth would be helpful. So um, my second question was, how many of you are educators feel that you are currently offering trauma-informed education to young people? And uh, maybe towards the end, I can hear what that response is and we will find out. So trauma-informed care isn't just a trend. Uh, it's here to stay because it is person first. And regardless of who you are as a student, a facilitator, a provider, a client, um, you're seen as somebody, we are seen as somebody who may have experienced or is, ex is experiencing trauma. And you and we deserve to be treated with compassion and empathy. And only with this cultural shift will we be able to help ourselves and each other heal. 
So just a little context, in 2008, according to Advocates for Youth, there were 26 evidence-based sex education curricula available, and none of them were trauma-informed. Um, and that's from the Trauma-Informed Approach for Adolescent Sexual Health, you could find online. So the times are definitely changing. ACEs education is being more exposed throughout the edu entire educational system. Here in Alaska, we have a statewide trauma-informed care presentation that's about one hour and it's available for all school staff. And I don't know that it's required by districts, but it is offered. And a lot of our school staff here in the community have participated in that and our staff has as well. And I um, encourage you to reach out to, and um, look that up. We also have through the Department of Health and Social Services, uh, so dhss.alaska.gov, you can find the ACEs report of Alaska. So that's finding more specific ACEs uh, statistics with Patrick Sidmore as the contact person. And Patrick's really great to work with as far as getting specific data. If you want it in a different format so you can use it in a presentation, he's very open to that and very approachable. Um, as far as finding some other specific data for presentations or your lessons, the YRBS, the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, uh, Taslina Mannix is the YRBS coordinator, and she is also very approachable and appreciates being um, sought out for specific youth data, and she can assist in breaking that down by region, and you can request beyond school district wide. Um, however, they do have limitations in our rural state, of course, of singling out schools specifically because of confidentiality, which is great. So some schools are integrating trauma-informed care into the entire social emotional learning programs that they're implementing. Other schools are infiltrating throughout their entire system to be trauma-informed. So that would involve all school staff, meaning custodial services, administration, and really importantly, students to being on board with that too. So um, considering and being aware of where your school district is with that, if they are aware of trauma-informed care, if they have access to information about it, um, and being able to provide that to them, if you find that they would like more information or are open to learning more, could be helpful. Oops, sorry. Okay, so our team has been involved with trauma-informed care planning and organizing for Ketchumak Bay Family Planning Clinic in the past year in a more official way. So working with the Southern Kenai Peninsula Resilience Coalition, uh, we have been aligning with the National Council for Behavioral Health Trauma-Informed Care Domains. And I encourage you to look that up. If you just Google trauma-informed care domains, it's gonna be the first um, three links that come up with a Google search. And again, that was the National Council for Behavioral Health. And the two domains that we focused on were trauma-informed, educated, and responsive workforce. And what that really has done for our organization is help us get more official with making sure that all of our staff is on board with ACEs education, uh, Green Dot Violence Prevention Program, which we have here in, the, in our community. And also we have the coordinator on staff as well. Youth Mental Health First Aid training, which I also am a, an instructor of, and just being involved with the development of the Alaska Statewide ACEs and Resilience Curriculum, which is um, going to be, in the next couple months, um, distributed statewide through the Alaska Resilience Initiative. And I really encourage everybody to use that curriculum. It's being developed with about 20 people involved and uh, to actually many more than that, but 20 is kind of the core team and making it as accessible as possible for all people, whether you only have 40 minutes to talk about ACEs in your community or you have uh, beyond that up to an, a full day presentation. And it's all trauma informed and I think it's gonna be pretty great and, and uh, very useful for our state. The other domain that we chose to focus on as an organization was early screening and comprehensive assessment of trauma. So what that really did for us was help update our medical um, intake forms. We have uh, gender options available that we did not have historically. We updated our intake process to include a disclaimer that this is a safe place to share or not share personal information, depending on the clients, um, uh, how they feel about that and updating our health referral system. So clients actually leave with a physical referral document as a, um, as a more 
persuasive way to help people get connected to the resources in our community. And so it's been a it's been a year long process, but we've made just those specific changes in our organization, and we already can already tell throughout all of our departments um, and a staff about up to 25. Um, that it really has been making a difference and getting us all on the same page with what trauma means to us and how we define it and and how our culture of our organization um, feels to our clients and our community. So to get to this slide now, our team also focuses on culturally inclusive materials. And that can mean anything from Alaska Native adaptations so adapting for timing issues. Uh, when we teach in the rural villages across Ketchumak Bay, we are fl flying in or boating in, and we often lose up to an hour of implementation time just because of the way transportation works. No matter how well we logistically plan for it, it's just the case. And so being aware of that, um, also being aware of the family roles, including youth roles in the community, so that um, you are not speaking down to anyone being an active listener and being open to learning from the community? And what are the other practices that practices in the community like hunting and storytelling that really influence the values um, throughout the people? Also, like Jordan just um, extensively went over, LGBTQ inclusion. So using preferred pronoun introductions, um, identifying and defining terminology and providing resources um, for your students as you're teaching. A positive connection with others, we find that to be um, among the most important for our team. That's why we use peer educators. So having a trained staff among the peer-to-peer peer -peer range is awesome, but if that's not accessible for you, just making sure that everybody's working within the positive youth development framework, um, allowing time in the classroom or in the uh, learning setting to um, to know when you're connecting um, with others and being honest and open, especially with teenagers, because they're so good at seeing through any anybody who's bluffing or not sharing information, honestly. So professional development is a huge one. It can be a struggle in rural communities. So accessing online presentations like this one, um, not always the best way to get information because it's not as interactive but especially when they're recorded like this YouTube Live, you can access it with your team at a later time. So um, going through the resources and really looking at what's available to us because the field of sexual health changes so frequently and really using what we learn from the resources in our lessons and making a point to update our lessons so that we are always um, offering the most up-to-date information and using, of course, trusted online resources. So, Skip a little bit here. Adequate time for instruction. I included that one because that is our largest challenge as a peer ed team. So the struggle to fit in what we know we need to cover with sexual health education, but not maxing the implementation time. So allowing time students the time to reflect. A lot of the trauma-informed care language and compassion and empathy that we are hoping to convey as facilitators can really happen during student reflection time. And when it's not a stress time and you're trying to get to the next thing, like I am right now with this presentation. It just allows for more real and honest communication. Um, also, allowing time for advance warnings about potentially triggering uh, materials in the lesson and doing a little pre-work there of having the plan set up with the school um, or community partner staff. So if a student opts to sit out, then what will they be doing? Who can they go talk to? The counselor, the nurse, who's gonna be available for them if they need somebody to talk to right then and there. Um, the personal chill plan is from streetwise to sexwise. I'll be showing a slide of that later. And that just seemed, I haven't um, gotten into that fully because we haven't purchased that curriculum yet, but we definitely plan to. But a personal chill plan is really a reflective thing for students to do themselves to identify how they are able to cope with um, difficult times and what they do to get themselves back to a regulated state. A uh, very easy, simple one to offer in the class is fidget toys. So anything from Play-Doh to bubbles to chewing gum. Our most recent purchase was of uh, juggling scarves. We purchased about 50 of them. They're about $1 to $2 each. And we are working them into our lessons so that everybody has to stand up and actively use their arms. You're stretching out. You're passing them to each other so you're interacting. 
And it really just stimulates a different part of the brain so that you can come back to learning and all be more focused and more um, on board. And that fits into our body regulation techniques, which we start every single sexual health lesson with. And I really appreciated some of the facilitators at the conference did as well. Um, not very many, actually only two of the presentations I went to, but um, it was always really nice because we were sitting there for three days as conferences go. And it's just really nice to have a break and to be able to stand up and um, do whether it was tapping or breathing activities, just to um, get our brains more focused on what we're there to do and get back into our bodies. And just the final shout out there is to never skip self-care activities. So if we talk about self-care as facilitators and then we run out of time and we don't allow for the self-care activity to actually happen, we're sharing a message that it's good to talk about, but really we don't have time to do it right now. So, you know, so really modeling that self-care is important to you as a facilitator and as a team and that you encourage your students to do that. And one way to do that is by sharing resources that they can use directly. So this is one that's available um, on YouTube, so it's available for everybody. And our peer education team made this this summer with Dr. Linda Chamberlain, our friend here in Homer. And Linda Chamberlain is a neuroscientist who works in public health, and she leads Capacitar for this training. And it is about an hour long, but the activities are only a couple minutes, um, two to about seven minutes each long. So I really encourage you to watch this and use this in your office setting or in your classrooms and find the ones that you like the most and have Linda lead the class um, for that body regulation technique. And they're everything from breathing to tapping to finger holds. So really um, probably some new information there that was new to us, Capacitar, but it's use it used internationally. So we really appreciate having that tool. Okay, and this is the um, Dr. Steve Brown's uh, Streetwise to Sexwise. It is, I believe, in its fourth edition now. It's been around for a couple decades, but always getting better and is um, was definitely uh, said that it is trauma-informed and not other, other curricula didn't necessarily put that straightforward as something that they were very proud of with their curricula. So this stood out to me in that way. Um, and just a shout out to the Center for Sex Ed who put the conference on. They uh, provide this curriculum as well as many, many others and hundreds of resources for sexual health educators um, and other just materials in general about sexual health. And you can become a member for, I think it's, I don't know, around $100 to $300 a year for an organization. And then you get discounted rates on all their materials. And I did notice at the conference that the majority of attendees were members and they were getting free resources throughout the conference um, with that membership. So that could be helpful for your, your organization. And then Dr. Steve Brown, I really liked when he shared this quote. Um, he really helped, he did a keynote presentation and he really helped confirm the team values that we have here that when you show that respect is not debatable in your class, you're sharing a message with students. And when you acknowledge the prevalence of ACEs, you're sharing a message with students. And when you focus on hope and resilience as being two things that all young people can completely achieve and already are, it's not that um, to be resilient, we have to do more, even just coming to school, deciding to wake up and get out of bed, hopefully eat breakfast, but being present in that class is showing that the, the young people in front of you are already being resilient. So I really appreciated his perspective on that. Okay, and then finally, to wrap up trauma-informed language, um, this is a free GIF. It's debated on our peer ed team if they're called GIFs or GIFs, but it's .gif. And if you just Google um, Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T dot com, you can put this into your PowerPoints, um, which we've been doing, especially in the middle school. Uh, students really appreciate it to have a visual when we lead core practice. Um, so it's really nice to offer a breathing technique like this when you are done talking about tough subjects like sexual assault prevention or sexual harassment or anything that could be triggering. Or if you just as a, a facilitator need a break and you need to take a breath, um, you can ask that your students follow this. We do two to three minutes and we time that out and we start and finish with a chime as well. All right. 
And continue, continuing on to consent, I'm going to pick up the speed here just a little bit because we don't have too much time left. Um, this is a quote when I was making this presentation, our lead peer educator, Chloe, um, verbalized this, and I really appreciated it because I think it's really the, the truth among um, the truth I've heard shared among educators that we know consent's essential to talk about. Um, we know why it's important, but really when it comes down to it, it's just tough in real life sometimes. So our job is to provide that education and language skills to people of how they can actively do that in their relationship. Um, a couple of things I really liked from Jenna Emerson in a class I went to practicing consent like a Quaker. She said, you are asking for consent because you don't want to harm somebody. You are asking for consent because you want to have a pleasurable because you want to have pleasurable sex. We are not asking for consent just to avoid breaking the law. So I thought that was a great tone to go into consent in any of our lessons with. Um, this quote is from the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom, the BDSM and Kink Community Incorporated, and that's bondage, domination, sadism, and masochism. So some of the questions that they offered on their pamphlet about consent is, what will we be doing? Why are we doing this? Where is it okay to touch? And how can we stop what is happening if anybody in the situation wants that to stop? So I thought that was very concise and simple, and we plan to, um, to have that tone when we're talking about consent. Here's a resource um, that I came home with that we are just starting to look through. It's a book. Um, and it was pretty prominent throughout the conference. It was being shared. Well, it was free. It was a gift for all attendees. So of course, everybody was kind of buzzing about it. Um, but they offer a 45 to 60 minute safer choices program for middle school and high school students where um, specific how-to skills for determining the right age to date um, and who is right for them to date to requiring verbal consent before any sexual intimacy, intervening when friends hook up under the influence of alcohol or drugs, and supporting survivors of sexual assault, just to name a few. And so uh, just a shout out to this program too, if you purchase it during January, February, March, and bring it into your schools, they're offering a lot of free teaching materials. It's a really steep cost, not one that our program would have been able to pull off with our funding, um, but that could be a way to make it more approachable to work into your uh, curriculum. And of course, a lot of it will align with the Alaska Safe Children's Act, which we're all as school district required now to um, offer information K through 12 about sexual assault prevention and safe touch and everything that has to do with that. All right, shifting gears to parents. We all got the privilege of seeing Dr. Jocelyn Elders, who is the 15th US Surgeon General under the Clinton administration. She presented one night and she was just a gem to listen to. Um, I really appreciated how she talked about parents as educators as being a necessary part, um, that we do need them to be involved. And I was going to break this down a little bit more, but really all I wanted to say is this is the program. I went to her presentation and it was super on point and um, very helpful. This is one flyer that she that I left with, but we plan to purchase this um, for our adult talk events. We offer community wide and in the, in the schools and in the community um, for any adult in the lives of preteens or teens. But this really can provide you with exactly the steps, literally the nine steps you see here, of how you can approach parents and support them in being the educators in, the, in their teen's life. Because really, as sexual health educators, we are just supplemental, hopefully, to the information that they are going to be receiving at home, at their friends' homes, among their peers. So getting the information to align at home with what we are providing in the school um, can be really, really helpful. And of course, the the value system would not come from us as educators, but she really breaks it down of how to talk about and explore your own values as a parent and how to approach them in an effective way with your teen. So I'm sorry I can't go more into that because we're a little low on time. I'm going to keep going with resources for you all that I found helpful. Um, Jordan turned us on to this, the endangeredspeciescondoms.com. Um, they are specific to endangered species and who doesn't think that animals are cute, especially if they're on the endangered species list, they get more attention, which is great. 
But uh, on their website, their motto is have safe sex, save the world. I really appreciate that. Um, 22 million people in developing countries want to avoid pregnancy, but are unable to access contraception. So they're out to change that statistic. So I really like how they provide a solid basis to what our jobs as sexual health educators are. We're making a bigger difference than we realize. Um, it's a bigger picture than the students that are right in front of you. They may be making decisions for the rest of your their life based on the evidence-based info that we share with them. So that's great. Um, sorry for this graphic. Say with a condom is an awesome organization. Benjamin Sherman is the owner and CEO. And Benjamin, I talked to just this past week on the phone with, and he is very, very approachable and fun. And his he started this whole uh, program when Barack Obama was running for president. Uh, he made condoms that said wrap your cock with Barack. And from there, it just took off. And now it's a national. They provide condoms uh, nationally in large, large amounts. And this is also who the Wrap It Up Alaska campaign printed with historically. And they're about to release a Frankly campaign. So on the condoms, it says, on the condom wrapper, it says, Frankly, I don't want to get pregnant. Or Frankly, we don't do it without one. So really basic messages about communicating, about using contraception, specifically condoms. And our team's discussing um, purchasing many of these condoms with upcoming funding so that we can work them into our lessons to provide really specific tools for teens as they communicate about contraception. Uh, lots of lube companies were available at the conference, of course. Um, and this brought up the uh, sexual response cycle and how to include pleasure. And there's so much to say about that. So I won't because there's not time, but there's lots of great resources. And I, um, Again, everybody who wants to use a condom should have one. That's a very um, basic starting point that if we could achieve that, we could really change statistics in the way that we're hoping as sexual health educators. Um, a couple of inspiring quotes that I had down in my notes. I really appreciate this. Um, the, the question here during this keynote was addressing is it time to close the book on sexual education? So doing, due to the declining pregnancy rate and evidence-based information just a click away on the internet, has the need for sexual health come and gone? And Dr. Lin Laura Lindbergh's response was definitely no. Um, your physical presence, especially with a compassionate delivery, acknowledging where we are as sexual health educators um, is because others before us have blazed the trail and allowed us to be in the classrooms and be offering comprehensive sexual health education. And even though sometimes it can feel like there's a lot of barriers in our way, uh, it's so important to know that the, the work needs to continue and that sexual health education is a human right. And again, just some more empowerment for all of us as educators. So really being there, being present, giving young people the time um, can really make the difference. Dr. Steve Brown said, your moment to moment interactions with teens matter more than you think. As sex educators, we're like brain surgeons just without the scalpel. And finally, uh, I really appreciated this. Dr. Elders really focused on sticking to your principles and never backing down and knowing that um, young people being empowered to vote. So there's a lot of political um, environment at the conference, of course but empowering young people to vote and knowing that they have the ability to make decisions that are healthy and good for them is, um, is really probably about the best that we can do to offer as educators. And the same old issues may come up with parents potentially being barriers, schools and admins being barriers, statistics not looking the way we might want them to, but overall we know sexual health is a human right and I was looking for that encouragement going to this conference and I really came home pumped up and empowered by that. And I really thought that was a relief after um, being an educator for seven years. So thank you for listening to our presentation. I'm sorry I went over a little bit on time. We have a few minutes left, it looks like, for questions. And again, please reach out if you have any questions yourself. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I um, am going to go ahead and open up for questions here. And I know we received two, and I'll be looking for another one. I'm going to start with um, Anna, actually. Um, 
So first, one of the questions I received, can you hear me okay, Anna? I can. Okay. Um, are your modifications for your different audiences already built into your lessons to be HB 156 compliant? Yes, so any information that we are teaching currently is in the schools. Um, aside from one community, we teach with the Nanilchik Traditional Council in the community, but we still there teach the same information that is from our rural adaptation of our lesson package. And in September, our Board of Ed approved for the second year in a row all of our materials and our presenters um, individually so that, yeah, all, everyone we present with and all of our information has the approval per HB 156. And we're happy to talk more about that and share and collaborate. Fabulous, thank you. Um, okay, so Jordan, at the conference, was there any discussion on incorporating hot topics in the news of the news into education um, when talking about sexual health? I feel like they really liked the idea. Doodling came out really cool, so it was a way to allow teens, if um, it was too visually or verbally stimulating, they could um, draw and doodle on things. Um, uh, hot Topics, another one was like Kahoot. Uh, it's a interactive app, so that way people could say answer on an app in lifetime like this, so this would be teens who all had cell phones or something so that would already be a maybe upper middle class teens but that way they could like shout out an answer on that and it wouldn't be specific to them like raising your hand in front of other people ever knows that you're the one answering the question but if it was something anonymous like that that way that way someone could say something maybe like an anonymous questions box like so they're not too embarrassed to ask something um yeah hot topics i think this also depends on if you're teaching in the school district or if you're teaching in a, a separate class so youth really like collaboration so asking questions getting them to work with you rather than um uh also um rather than telling them what to do so that's really important to collaborate uh youth have a lot of bosses so determining that uh they have a lot of other stuff going on, so being as, as inclusive and po as possible. So collaboration with teens rather than telling them what to do. Nobody likes being told what to do. <laughs> totally. Um, one other piece too, like the Aziz Asari um, issues that have come up in the media and just trying to walk through really how um, challenging consent can be. So that would be another way to, to find ways to think about current issues that are going on. It just seems like right now the media is ripe with a lot of that information for sure. Um, one thing real quick that we offered when the sexual harassment came up repeatedly during our um, Flex High School implementation, which was great to have brought up, was we ended up referring to the Alaska Youth Law Guide so that students did know what their rights were um, and trying to empower them to learn their rights and know them and know how to access them. And I think that's something we're gonna continue doing. Absolutely. All right, um, just checking back. I don't look like we have any other questions at the moment. So um, thank you all very much for joining us for the first ever Youth Alliance for Healthy Alaska educational video on the topic of Alaska sexual health. We hope you enjoyed the content and let us know if there are future youth-led um, related topics that you might find beneficial for youth, for Alaska, and for our health. Um, have a sexually healthy 2018, and thanks again for joining us.